This is the Relics Audio Hour. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Relics Audio Hour. I am your host, Jesse Lauder, and boy, do we have a special one lined up for you today. It's been a little bit since we last dropped in, but I hope your summer has been full of good times, good weather, good music, and that not too many curveballs were thrown your way. So this past weekend, Dayglow Ventures, our parent company, hosted the sixth annual Lock-In Festival. If you've never been to Lock-In, it's a wonderful festival that highlights the diverse taste of our greater scene. With this weekend's lineup featuring classic staples such as Dead & Company, P-Funk, Sheryl Crow, Toots and the Maytals, as well as future torchbearers like Margot Price, Moon Taxi, and a band near and dear to my heart, the Tedeschi Trucks Band. For artists playing the festival, Lockin' is sort of like a family reunion, allowing for musicians and old friends to truly spend some quality time together in beautiful Arrington, Virginia. And usually these reunions turn into amazing collaborations on stage. Two of those friends who punctuated the weekend for many were Eric Krasno of Lettuce and Soul Live fame, and Dead & Company's John Mayer. I'm going to briefly pass the mic to Editor-in-Chief Dean Budnick so he can talk a little bit more about Kraz and Mayer's history and their relationship with Relics Magazine. Thanks, Jesse. I first met Eric Krasno in late 1997 at the original House of Blues in Cambridge, Mass. I was taping a Grey Boy All-Star show. Eric noticed my microphones, approached me, and handed me the debut cassette just recorded by his band Lettuce, which had formed a couple years earlier after meeting at a Berkeley College of Music high school summer program. By this point, Krasno was no longer attending Berkeley, although John Mayer was then beginning his own brief stint at the school following a Connecticut adolescence in which he had attended New York City's Wetlands Preserve and other area clubs doing his own recording of artists such as Charlie Hunter and Modesky Martin and Wood. The two musicians were introduced by current Dave Matthews band trumpeter Rashawn Ross, who attended Berkeley with Mayer and later appeared with Krasno and Soul Live. In 2007, Mayer invited Krasno and Soul Live to open some dates on his Continuum tour. This past weekend, the two musicians crossed paths once again at the Lockin Festival, where Mayer was on hand with Dead & Company while Krasno was performing with Lettuce. Kraz stepped away from that band as a full-time member in 2015 due to commitments with Soul Live and the Eric Krasno band, but jumps back in on occasion, as he did this past weekend, along with special guests Mayer, Bob Weir, O'Teal Burbridge, Kofi Burbridge, and a few others during an exceptionally satisfying lettuce tribute to the Jerry Garcia band. Relics was on hand to report all of this in the official daily newspaper we created for the festival, the Lock in Times. You can read some of our daily coverage at relics.com. There, you can also find feature stories from Relics Magazine on the formation of Dead & Company, as well as multiple pieces on Krasno's longtime work in Lettuce, Soul Live, and the EKB. In one piece, Krasno discusses reconnecting with Mayer in 2016 to discuss guitar tones after Krasno began performing with Phil Lesh. While you're there, why not subscribe as well? Our September issue focuses on the Relics 44, which identifies 44 people, places, and things that inspire us, including a certain mechanical communication device given to Mayer by Tom Hanks. As for this episode of the Relics Audio Hour, moments prior to the interview, on Sunday afternoon, following that late night lettuce set, I happen to be chatting with Kraz then John walked over, greeted Eric, and the two were escorted to a secret, undisclosed location. I'm going to hand the mic back to Jesse, who can set the scene that followed, and tell you more about this new segment that we are affectionately calling Conversations with Kraz. So as Dean just alluded, this episode is going to kick off what we hope is the first of many, of Eric Krasno talking to other musicians about their craft conversations with Kraz, if you will. This debut segment with John Mayer covers many topics, including songwriting, guitar playing, and of course, the Grateful Dead. The location wasn't too secret. We did it in a Winnebago backstage at Lockin, so you can faintly hear Tedeschi Trucks' set in the background. But here it is, in all of its glory, 
John Mayer, and Eric Krasno. Enjoy. I do find that interesting about people, that if the both of us were on a deserted island and, uh, no, 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 if the both of us had a virus yeah. and there was one antidote, we would probably split the antidote and both die. And both die. Yeah, because you'd feel so guilty. You know what it's, I mean? It's like, no, you, no, you people, like, it, like, otherwise. I feel like that's the music industry right now. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> everybody just split the pie so thin yeah. so that nobody actually eats. Right. But then nobody doesn't eat. But then no one eats. It's a very strange Yeah, division. no, it is strange. It is I strange. I don't know. Yeah, how do you, well, I guess that's like a, a good kind of segue is like, how do you find music right now? Like, how do you, how do you find music? Like, how do you, how do you find what to listen to? It depends what I have in my mind at any given yeah. time based yeah. on what I'm going to get from music. Right. So I just finished, and you must have also given your last, the last thing you sent me musically, like take trips through like the Spotify top 50. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Sometimes under duress, because I want to understand it. I th right. I think you and I are both about the same age, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, almost exactly. Yeah, and we're almost about yeah. the point where most people in our situation get phased out. And and I'm very curious about not getting phased out. Right. Uh, that doesn't always mean making what everyone's making, but I think if you can come to an understanding of it, I'm not sure you have to get phased out. No, it's true. I mean, I, I get in a lot of conversations slash arguments with people that try to write off anything that's current. I mean, I have a lot of friends. I mean, I think maybe, you know, especially, you know, in this scene here, there's a lot yeah. like people aren't always listening to current records. And it's really important to me to always hear what people are getting into. Yep. What, and, I, and I'm sure it's the same for you. And, and, you know, I go to the top 50 and I would say there's one out of every 10 or so that I actually like currently. They have something. Even if yeah. you don't like them as songs, they offer something. It's sort of like a trip to a library for me sometimes. Yeah. It's like a research project. Right. Because, you know, I mean, I start backwards from like, people aren't wrong. Right. right? Like, I think, I, I, I don't, I just don't feel like believing that in, in one year there was this changeover where just like people I don't identify are being born. I just don't like right. the idea. So, Maybe all it is is two or three steps away from my understanding, not a completely right. alien thing, you know? And then, But also, you also have to balance that with some shit doesn't belong to you. Let me ask you this. So you like, know what when, I mean? Like, you have to yeah. listen to it and go, this is not for me, so it doesn't doesn't require my criticism. Right. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. You just got to respect it for what it is. I mean, I'm like that with a lot of like current like trap and like hip hop. It's like if I get too crazy into it, I I, I can't think about it too hard. I got to just try to. F and that's that's another thing. Sometimes the production is what I listen for. That's exactly right. And sometimes right. it's that's the, the library the lyrics and, and the music. I mean, can you see past really horrible lyrics and just listen to the music and be and, and, uh, and enjoy it yeah but i don't know but see <laughs> oh, i guess it's hard, horrible is the, well that is, so maybe, check yeah. it out like you have a culture now that subscribes to their artists yeah. and doesn't ever leave yeah. they basically say i will contort my brain to accept anything you give me right. we watch it happen every week something comes somebody comes out with something and you watch it's like to be a fan now is to give up at some point any critical or editorial sense for the most part right like if somebody drops a bomb i don't see people cover for it when it's a bomb but you see people in this unspoken agreement we're going to get our head around whatever you put out right do you know you know, you know what i mean kanye so well yeah that's yeah. a whole different i mean i've been i went to a club <laughs> not long ago and i heard and i was like oh this is like your agreement is yeah. like you're a mets fan yeah like I'm seeing this kind of, kind of Mets fan thing where it's right. like even if the team isn't all that great. I mean, like I'm an, I grew up a Knicks fan. It's the hardest fan to be in the world, and it's one of those things where you just I, I've always and I, and I have some some musical equivalents, but I, eventually I'll have to check out. Yeah, usually. well, people but, are like screwed into their artists. Yeah, like yeah. completely screwed in, right. and they're sort of saying, "You tell me what's cool." And I'll go with it. Right. And at first, I'll think those shoes are stupid. And if I see it another six times, I'll want them. <laughs> and that's sort of the conversion process that happens with hearing something right. you don't like. Right. And instead of saying, I don't like it, yeah. they now say, I just don't get it yet. Right. And so it's this constant elasticity of the brain going, right. well, now I like it. I didn't like it when I first heard it. And now I do. Well, and sometimes, you know, that's why they say, you know, like radio breaks an artist. A lot of times they just play, play it enough and people are going to like it kind of no matter what. Yeah. You know, well, that's what we see now is yeah. I love you. I F with you. Yeah. 
And therefore, whatever you give me, I'm going to work as hard as I can to assume that it's right and I'm not and I'm going to come to it. By the way, I'm not lambasting that. Like, that's just the way things are now, you right, know? And right. for me and for you, it's really like people don't unfollow people. People don't give up on people anymore. Like your guy is your guy right. for a hundred years now. I mean, you can also say it spills over into politics too. It's like, if you disappoint me, absolutely, I'll just change my expectations for you, right. and then you're okay again. You know, right? So, for, so there's all these new things. Well, I think some people enjoy the ride to a certain degree. I think that's Agreed. a lot, of that, and that relates to the Grateful Dead in, a big, in a big way. Agreed. I, you know, I, th I think part of. I mean, it was almost like, and I remember. So I, I saw the Grateful Dead when I was 12 years old. My brother brought me to a show, and he was 18. I had an older brother who would bring me to concerts and all the different things, and he started explaining to me this culture that they would trade the tapes and who saw what show, what songs did they play, and why was this night better? And some some nights were better than others, some night had the set list you liked, but it was this thing where you went every night because you wanted to mm -hmm. see, not even, you wanted to see the bad show and the good show. You wanted to like be able to converse about it with all your friends. You yeah. wanted to like have both experiences because you can't have this super, super high without some sort of I dip. say they're like baseball cards. Dead I shows, said, I said dead shows are packs of baseball, uh, yeah. a set list is yes. a pack of baseball yes. cards. And you hope you get the one you need. Right. And you go, got it, got it, got it, need it, got it, need yeah, it, got yeah, it, need yeah. it. And and some nights you say, got it the whole time, yeah. you know? And I learned, I think, probably on this tour, ultimately, that that's part of what people like about it. And it's not part of what I like about it. Me and too. it forces me to get off of my pop guy thing. Yeah. And the part, part of being a pop guy is fear. Fear is just innate to being a pop guy. What yeah. if they don't like it? Yeah. What if this doesn't become a hit? Yeah. What if it's this? What if it's that? And so for me, ultimately, like my thing is always, well, I don't know if there's enough bangers on here. Yeah. And when we think back to our favorite records, like our favorite dead live tapes, some of them have no bangers on yeah. them, yeah. quote unquote. Yeah. And they're great. Like it's just a real good uh, Mexicali blues. Well, it's you know? hard to trust your audience sometimes. And this goes back to, and I mean, this, and this works in, I think, both places it's like you can trust them but i i don't want to a lot of times like i i want there to be bangers all the way through the record that's what, that's and a lot of times like you know my the last record i made the mo the song that everyone comes up to me and likes the most is the slow song at the end that i almost didn't put on yeah. the record yeah and that was i was like i can't put this out there this is like i mean they're gonna be so bored and uh, but you know you just you never know. Yo, if the fans right. got to hear everything I did in the studio and yeah. pick the record, yeah. two things. They would love the record and I would never <laughs> be able to recognize what it was. Right. I would they would if they were in the studio and went, no, finish that. We love that. Right. I know the track list would be completely different. Yeah. I just don't know a better system. There's just not a better system for creating things. You it's gotta I, I always say there's four rules to writing a song, uh, to, 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 to looking at a song you're about to write or whether you want to keep working on it. Is it good? Yeah. Do I like it? Because those are two yeah. separate things. Right. Is it me? Because that's three separate things. And do yeah. I want to do it live night after night? Or yeah. can I? You know, is it replicable? Right. And at this point in my career now, it's like, there can be a really good song, but if it's not me, I just refuse to put it out anymore. Right. What about um, rep what about replicating it? Is that is that something that you do? You separate the live show from the record. I mean, obviously you do somewhat, yeah. but I mean, do you say, oh, I, this is, or do you, or do you just make your tracks and go, I I, I love this. I'm I'm doing I this. I mean, when I made uh, I made a record called uh, Battle Studies, and I didn't think about playing them live. I just thought about like, is this like a neat song? So I didn't ask myself, is it me? Do I like it? I was, you know, I just went, that's one. And I remember being on stage and like starting these songs off and a marked difference in the crowd reaction for those songs versus the older ones. And I went, oh no. And I think ever since that record, I now imagine myself on stage for most of the songs. I think yeah. it's okay to have yeah. one or two where you'll never play them. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah. like, I wrote a song the other day and this is not the first time I've done this, where the main line of the chorus was falsetto, and the part I could really sing was the harmony under the falsetto. Right. How do you do that? You get someone else to sing that part. So now, you, that now you're in a, already <laughs> in like a hall of mirrors trying, yeah. to, trying to get that yeah. done, you know? Yeah. yeah. And songwriting is, is really a full contact blood sport with right. yourself. Right. It's obnoxious how obsessed you have to be to get there. Oh, yeah. I worked on a song. I thought I had one a week ago. Stopped the presses. Yeah. All I did was work on this song. And then I realized 
probably don't want to go to Germany and do this. You know, right, you've got to be able right, to unpack right. the song in Europe and want to go there in your mind. Right. You know what right. I mean? Absolutely. I mean, those Absolutely. are the, those are hits to me. Hits aren't radio hits. You know, I don't even know. I mean, I have a song on the radio that's a hit. I yeah. have no idea where it is, yeah. how yeah. it's doing. I rely on other people to tell me via email it's doing right. it. I don't feel it in the world. The world is splintered into a billion different pieces. Yeah. But what I care about is do I want to go to Lawrence, Kansas and play that yeah, song right. there. Right. And if I want to get there and unpack my suitcase metaphorically and otherwise and yeah. go play that song there, then it's a hit song to me. Right, right. And like, for that reason, I can't wait to go play New Light because I want to play that song a million times. I'm, if, it, if it's only a good song, technically, and right. doesn't, isn't a place I want to revisit, I right. should just start giving them to other people. Yeah, I mean, that's all, you know, have you, have you done much of that? Have you... No, I'm just starting now to co-write. I never understood it. Now I'm starting to understand co-writing. But no, I've never... My stuff is so unique to my own inability as a singer. Like, I, I write songs around my voice. Yeah. I have to put a lot of tricks into my songs, meaning, like, they're me. Because when I hear someone... Like, for instance, when I hear someone else cover my song, I go, oh, man. It's like the old Henny Youngman line. Oh, no, 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 it wasn't Henny. It was uh, Ronnie Dangerfield. It's yeah. like, Eric, I have to, but you... You know, right, like uh, right, right. giving punchline first, but run it, <laughs> yeah, walking yeah, yeah. in on your best friend oh, having hilarious. sex with your wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, have to, yeah. but you, that's you know, classic. I look at it like that with classic. my music. I, I'll look at, I'll turn on the TV or something, or I'll see a clip online of like a singing competition show, and I'll go, "Oh man, I have to." But you, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do this. I have funny. to because yeah. I can't. I don't yeah. have the range. Right, right. Well, I'm. The, I, I actually was co-writing before, or I mean, essentially, I was writing within bands first and mm -hmm. wasn't singing them and then started writing for other people and that became a thing I did for a long and just in the last few years started actually singing my song so I'm coming from a complete backwards thing wow. and really I'm just now figuring out where I can sing and where and that's changing the whole thing so you, for Yeah, me. you have to write within your range. I have to write within my range which I did yeah. not know yes. anything about and yes. I made a whole record not knowing that so it's all over the place I'm trying to figure it out and this now I'm kind of figuring it yeah. out but you know I didn't like getting to work with Tedeschi Trucks band I wrote a lot of songs with them and then Susan's got this and she can do anything if I were able to write like, so, if I had Susan's voice the number of songs that I could write <laughs> Would be like a whole other art. I would be like cloning myself. But it's super as another fun. Artist. I mean, I think it's like, like, and also kind of going into someone else's like head. And that's kind of what I do with, with the new record that I make. It's a concept record. So it's all coming from other people's perspectives and these conversations and whatever. And I think that's interesting. I mean, I, that's another thing I want to ask you is in, in your, your writing, are you usually sitting down and figuring out, okay, what do I want to say? 100%. Like, yeah. It's getting harder as I get older. Number one, I've said it. And I can say, you're, you're either a type of person who's done it once and went, well, by definition of having done it, I can't do it again. Right. Or you go, let's just do more of it. I don't have that. I, right. If I've done it, then by definition, I can't do it again. So there are fewer and fewer parking spaces that are open <laughs> right. for me for ideas, which is fine. It just means I have to work a little harder and I'll put fewer things out every year. But each thing just ha has to pass the standard. So right, right. right now I look at it like, what's my take on the world? Well, how do you how can you be honest right now about a world that isn't honest how can i sit down and write a song about the way people feel when people can't be honest right now about the way they feel because if they were we would all be fucking crying i mean what there, there's such emotional interference in the world like that's part of what this meme culture is part of it's all sort of cover up for the fact that you are actually kind of sad. You are actually kind of fatigued. So I don't really know how to unpack it as a writer right now. So yeah, everything I do has to come from the fact that I'm thinking about it in a way that I believe is different than anyone else is thinking about it. Right, right. If I were to write a song right now that was honest, it would be like, can we all just cry? Can we all just cry <laughs> and admit we don't know what we're doing and that we're faking all of it? Yeah. And that we all have the right idea and the competition for your right idea is so strong that it turns to anger before you ever get to express the totality of your good idea. That I see people discouraged about their own hope before they ever get a chance to exhibit it. I just see all of this gridlock, cultural, emotional, spiritual gridlock. And I'm supposed to sit down and just start tapping away on a typewriter and make a chorus out of that. <laughs> wow. You can't, I, you know, it's just, yeah. it's a different... 
there, there's, it's not the worst. Um, this is not the worst round to sit out. Yeah. yeah Does yeah. that make sense? I hear what you're saying. I I'm not negative saying. about it. But I'm also, just more... okay. Let's. I mean, like, the, the, so, um, let's let's talk um, Robert Hunter and, and Jerry Garcia. I mean, they they they're most. I mean, so much of that is like taking you into a different time and a different yeah. place. And like, has that has. Has that, or even Barlow, like, has that influenced you at all, or inspired uh, you at inspires all? Inspires and influences me, like, out of my mind. Yeah. S- yeah. Um, I don't know that I can match it, or right. or that I want to try and like. I think uh, I think there's a the difference between um, loving something and thinking you can do it. Right. I mean, I, trying to know? write a song like. China Cat Sunflower or Scarlet Begonias. I mean, like, how would you even I'm too go there? I'm too yeah, left brain. I'm too analytical. Yeah. And I'll know? go to those as like references, like, oh well, they're just talking about uh, you know, trombones and cats. And, yeah. And but but it's so beautifully put, so so well put together. But it's also grandfathered in, but based on an era. You know, right, it's grandfathered right, in right, because right, it's true to the era. Yeah, of course, so of I call I call a certain a certain style of writing. I call it Sally from the Alley okay. writing. <laughs> And right. I love those songs. Yeah. I love those songs. The songs about Sally from the alley. Yeah, yeah. If I let myself put one out, yeah. I wouldn't trust my instinct. Like, you right. would hear okay. me do it and go, Mayor, that's not you. I yeah. mean, I have to yeah. hear yeah. a song back and go, that's yeah. who I am. Yeah, yeah. And if I wrote this song, like, Sally from the alley, yeah. something's shaking, something, something, in the th- and the hearts so are funny. breaking. I'm using Sally that reference from- now. Yeah, Cause, Sally cause from lettuce, the alley. Because Lettuce needs songs like that. Like, when we write for Lettuce, it has to be funky and it has to be Nigel right. singing. So it has to be something you can't get too... You know, introspective. That's, you can't make. You can't depress anyone. This it's balance really hard to write songs like this. That. Nexus it's that like, you're talking about yeah. is where I live twenty four seven. Right. It's alchemy. It's right. like making fragrances. You're talking top notes, bottom notes. Mid, you're talking about six hundred different little essences, right. and you've got to take a little medicine dropper right. and build these little tiny fragrances based off of eight different things. Well, it's not to this, not to that, not to this, that. I am obsessed with it. It drives me insane. And I, w- and because we do have to find these balances, right. you know, you can't just be to, you know, Sally from the alley in the Cadillac shaking her thing. Come yeah. on, baby, bring it back. And baby right. mama, he cuts me to the bone. Right. You, 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 like I don't say cuts me to the bone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if I write a song and I'm going, eh, it cuts me to the bone. Yeah. Just hurl something at yeah. me <laughs> because I'll it's remember. not honest. Right. No, What's honest you. right you. now is like, man, we are all like children trying to entertain each other while our parents are screaming at each other. We are doing the thing that children do to protect themselves from the yelling and the screaming that they hear right. in the other room. My brothers and I, when that happened, you become besties. You yeah. just take care of each other. You try to make each other laugh. You think that's the silver lining, essentially? No, I think that's the I, funny colored umbrella. I mean, I feel like, I mean, right, right. I mean, you it's know? also like things like like Lockin and whatever. People are, I feel more, more than ever, people coming together. I mean, not to sound corny, but where people are... Do, understanding that they need to like cherish their times together. No, a hundred percent, dude. Mean? If you lost a wallet here, you'd get it back. Right, right. The right. stash would be gone, <laughs> but you'd get everything else back. You'd go, yeah, yeah. well, I've got my six hundred dollars in cash, but my stash is gone. Right, you right, know. Right. But no, if if you dropped a wallet at lock in, you would get it back. Just like I right, imagine, if you right. dropped the wallet in nineteen fifty eight, you'd get it back. Right, right. You know what I mean? Let's hope I get those shades back that I lost this morning. <laughs> well, look, I mean, I think about it all the time. Like, why can't why can't you develop your own sense of chronology? Right. You know, why can't you make time stand still however you like it? I, I often think, like, how far away are we from, like, sectors of culture just deciding that they're from the 70s? Right. Like, why, why can't you just be like, those are greasers <laughs> from the 50s, and it's 2020, and they've yeah, just decided yeah, yeah. to hang out by a payphone? Well, that's kind of what bands are sometimes. Like, you're I, right. You know what I mean? You're that's right. kind of what bands can do. That you're allows right. us to do that. You, you're, you know? not, you're not just being over... Like, that's yeah, not yeah. just an artistic thing to say. Yeah, that's a yeah. thousand percent right. Yeah, bands totally get to... Is. Get to say, yeah, well, we're from the seventies. Yeah, I saw I saw this thing on Instagram today yeah, of yeah. the Almond Brothers playing. Yeah, and I was like, why can't I get a Les Paul? And, yeah. and you and I can get yeah. together and not be spinal tap it. about it, but kind of go into <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. Well, like It'd I just fun. want, I just want to live everyone's yeah. life. Do you ever feel yeah. that way? Oh, you ever absolutely. see someone live a life and you go, why can't I live oh, that life? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think about 
a lot of a lot about the the fifties and that jazz era, and I'm just like, oh man, if I could. And when like Coltrane was like a pop star, you know, and Miles Davis, those were the coolest guys on the planet, and they were supposed to be. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like that era to me, I just wish I could spend. You know, you know, or like the late sixties in San Francisco, which my dad was in the mm-hmm. middle of. But I, you know, I would, I'd love to be there. I mean, there's, you know. I don't have much, I don't take much information from reality yeah. <laughs> and, and I should as I get older and, and I'll see, I'll see a photo or something from like the sixties and I'll get so inspired and actually deluded into believing I can do that. Right. Like if I just put my mind to it, the short of time travel that I can, instead of me going back to it, I can yeah. bring it here because yeah. you really can believe whatever you want to believe now. Yeah. There's no more cumulative uh, intelligence. You go like, well, I choose, I'd like to cherry pick that. What yeah. if you and I went on stage and with this band and we played, I played a gold top Les Paul Yeah. and I had the coily guitar cable, yeah, yeah. you know, well, and an I embroidered like strap. Us. And we went and played these <laughs> songs that were like Southern rock songs, but new. And we rolled on an old bus that broke down all of it. Like, I, I want, think we'd crush it. I want those experience. <laughs> you know what I mean? We'd crush it. Totally, totally. I have a hard time no, as I get be- older accepting that there are certain experiences that I long for that I'll never have. It's getting harder and harder to think that, yeah, I'm 40. Like you're not going to be able to, to like launch every idea you have. Do you have that? Cause you're, you, you have this Renaissance man thing. Well, I I jump around a lot. You know, I think that's my blessing and my curse is like that. I I get to do so much different stuff. I'm always working on a different record and I'm always like playing with a different band and, or, or, or running around. And in the last couple of years I've got, I've kind of, started focusing more on doing my own thing. I feel like you did your own thing for a long time. And now, you know, you, or I guess you always did different things, but and, and musically different things, but yeah. you know, now, especially being in dead and company and like, you know, I see you, I see you playing with a lot of different people. Yeah, now and now it's like, now it's, um, what's the word you would use? It's just sort of unbundled and untethered. Cause everything right. else is, I yeah, mean, yeah. it wouldn't have worked 15 years ago, but I'm hoping that in my life I can sort of, biorhythmically match whatever the world is supposed to get from me, you know? I, and, and I, I just know that my, my first, my first order of business is that if I was on a deserted Island and all the pieces to make a radio to get me off the Island were there, I could build the radio. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And I don't know how long it would take, but I just, I always want to have faith in myself that the world will never change so quickly as to completely eradicate me that all it takes is some rethinking and some stepping back and divorcing yourself from ego for a minute and go, okay, yeah. let's throw out everything we've ever done and just look at this like a musician. Right, right. Like you get to look at it every year like a musician. I know that I've had some pop success and I think a lot of people focus on that. I don't right. know if it's too much or not, but like we're musicians. So we always get to look at whatever's going on in the weather report and respond to it in some way that, it, 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 that agrees with it. Right. You know, you sent me a record that's you making a really competitively produced album of, of songs that sound like other songs. Not 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 in not in their composition, but it's just in the texture of it. Right. You know, and that's you going, I think I know how to survive no matter what. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, in, in certain. Yeah, I guess it was. I mean, in certain ways, it was kind of like a challenge. Can I make a record like in this space and make it sound coherent um, kind of without a band? And I kind mm-hmm. of said that before. And, uh, you know, it, it was, but, um, but yeah, that is part of it. Can I just play everything and, and, and write everything and try to try to do that? And it's, for me, it's like, like you said, you kind of see these different, you know, I guess kind of outlets, but also just like earmarks of like, I've always wanted to do that. You know, for me, it was like, I never sat down and played acoustic guitar and sang my songs. I was yeah. scared shitless of doing that and i'm just like making myself do that's also like a 40 thing it's kind of like i never did that let me try this right let me try that um and i think that's also the cool thing it goes back to like no one's unfollowing and i think that's also this this scene a little bit is able to embrace me for doing whatever i'll play we'll play instrumental lettuce for an hour and a half and then i'll go sit in the vip tent and play like acoustic songs yeah, for an hour. They like and the people are coming to both, you know, yeah, and they, they like you. I'm all, and I, but I, I guess I was afraid of that for a long time. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I can't just go there and sing these, these songs. They're not going to be into that, but really, you know, they're really supportive. I think that's something in the, that started in the, 
in the kind of Grateful Dead scene and has now kind of yeah. permeated all these different you, you, things. You, you could say like culturally we're like just having a moment. We're like having an affair with inauthenticity for a minute. Right. Everybody is having a fling with being <laughs> inauthentic. But I think by doing these things, it's also like letting me know. It's like, okay, okay, th this really works. And that's maybe right. this doesn't. And, and you're allowed to you go know? off and come back and go, oh, no, yeah. this, I had it right the first time. Right. I mean, that's life. Right. Life is getting it right. Yeah. Leaving that completely behind. Oh, yeah. Getting smacked yeah. and going, I had it right the first time. I think time. part of that, like realizing it and, and kind of getting to a good place. Yeah. Because I don't know if it's always cut and dry. I mean, with Soul Live, we did instrumental records for years. Then we decided we're going to like go into this realm and do this. And I don't know if that was the best idea, but we kind of had to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Because then we came back and now it's kind of somewhere right. in between. And by the way, you know what I mean? at its worst, what do you lose? Nothing. Yeah. You, you made a record that's a little like this and maybe yeah, you only yeah. play three songs off of it. Right, right. You know, there's no record I won't play a song off of. Right, right. So we're talking about like a, some sort of artistic immortality. Like you'll respawn. Right. If you make a record <laughs> that you thought was great and turns out it isn't, it's like yeah. getting shot in Call of Duty. Right, you just right. respawn. Right. And you're like, oh, I got to do another one. Right. So why would you not take chances? I mean, I. But I guess in, in the moment when you're like going to put something out, like sometimes there's a freak out moment. Oh, yeah. It's like, you don't. I mean, you don't see the two years down the line. You see, like, I'm going to put this out and people might hate it and holy shit. Yeah, but you but, know how I see it? The actual process of making the record will be the vetting process of whether it's good or not. Right. If you like something enough to listen to it, the number of times one must listen to something to write, record, edit, mix, and master. If you don't hate it by the time you're mastering <laughs> it, it's a it's good true. song. And other people are right. going to love it because they'll never hear it as many times as you hear it. Right. So right. you're basically pressure testing it for them. Like when I was, when I was m uh, mixing New Light, yeah. I was still jamming out to it. Right. I'm many hundreds of listens in. Right. So it's sort right. of like I'm doing the like the drop test on it. Right. And I'm like, no, it's not going to break because right. I've heard it more than you ever will. Yeah, yeah. So I find that the process <laughs> is yeah. the testing for it. And if I give up, like I give up on I give up on that song before I realize like I there's there is you ever write a song and you're like what's that first verse and the answer is there is no first verse right right the answer is there is no first verse because yeah. it's not a good enough song to finish and everyone else looks at it like when you throw a shirt away you yeah, ever yeah. you ever throw a shirt away in front of somebody and they just they go you can't throw a shirt away I'm here yeah. to tell you you can yeah but you can also throw away a song and they go you can't yeah. throw that song away and you go well that's one of the song. hardest things as a producer that i've is like you know when you get together with bands and artists they get really attached to certain song you know and that's the always that's sometimes the hardest thing for Ooh, me i can't imagine it's, it's being like, in a band and and it's like well that's and producing bands is the probably maybe the hardest job i've ever had because dealing with all of their crazy shit yeah you have to work you have to work inside of the maximum right. ability of the band, right? It's more being a psychologist than anything yeah. else. But then, but um, amongst that, some of the hardest things I've ever had to do is like, you know what, this song is just not, you know, that that's a tough conversation. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, this is a fun one because it's sort of devilish. Yeah. You get to steal any Grateful Dead song you want, remove it from history. No one ever knows it exists, Ooh. but you get to re-record it, and it's an Eric Krasno song. Which one do you steal? Now, remember this in the sort of quantum leap of it all. They don't know they're missing it, so you're not technically... you're not. There's no emotional loss oh, of having stolen one. it from them. I think that changes week to week yeah, I know. or month to month. Brown-Eyed Women has just got this thing. How Brown-Eyed Women that's is just... not a hit song. How, how Brown-Eyed Women was yeah. not a classic rock radio hit is beyond me. It's as good as any Stone it's song. It's so good. It's it, how it's not, and it brings you to a place. So that's that's something that that with, with the Grateful Dead music in general, but particularly that song is it brings me somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's like to that 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 no one no, no other song brings me to that same place. Yep. So I, I think that's, that's there's something about. That. I w I always thought that like if you stitch all of the Grateful Dead songs together, you get a town that's about I don't know. You, 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 you get about 20 square miles, you know, and the people know each other and there's overlap. And I also think it's sort of like Cuba right, where like there's right. still old cars, like nothing's new yeah, in Grateful yeah, Dead. Land. Like no one, in, no one in Grateful Dead lyric land ever has a new car. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's car is old. Yeah. yeah. The bottles are old and dusty. Yeah, exactly. It's Cuba in there. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's why we like going back in there. Yeah. And also there's a lot of kids with different 
parents. Yeah, there's a lot of gambling. A lot of people are are are. are you know, there's like there's you got someone in, you know Chino and yeah, but there's a, there's also you just get the sense there's not that many women. It's really the same person doing this to each. <laughs> a little bit each, like the shows. Actually, maybe not. Maybe not so much recently. But it's but, it's uh, wild though. It's like show, a lot of guys. We, we, you and I could sit. And, and lace together all these songs and come up with a world, a universe of yeah. these things, you know. That no one's ever fun. home. No one ever gets up in their living room and yeah. inside of these songs. Yeah. They're, they might be trying to get home. Yeah. But no one's home in a Grateful Dead song. That's true. Everybody's trying to get home. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's broke. And yeah. everybody's yeah. car is breaking down. Yeah. And But the, you get the sense that to be alive inside of a Grateful Dead song is to be sort of a sailor at sea, yeah. making the best of a stormy night. Was was there like a song or a situation that you remember that drew you into the their music? There's about thirty of them. Yeah, and most was of it those like a series of events. You're like, I need to go deeper. I need yo, to go deeper. I, there, go deeper. I can tell you what intersection I was at yeah. when these moments happened, which proves yeah. that they're very instant sort of epiphanies. Right. Where I was when I understood the chorus to Eyes of the World. I was right. at Ocean and and San Vicente. Yeah. Where I was when I understood the bridge. To estimated profit, I was, in, yeah. I was coming out of a gas station in Palm Springs, and where was I when I first understood that playing of the band had the part that went and where I mean, there I listened to five five seventy seven yeah. on the way from the Village Recorder in West LA to you know Beverly Hills or whatever, and the yeah. sun was going down, and I heard the transition between Scarlet and Fire, yeah, yeah. and I went, "This is the greatest thing I ever heard in my life." Yeah. How I didn't hear this in high school with my love of Jimi Hendrix is yeah, beyond yeah. me. You yeah, know? Yeah. So there's dozens and dozens and dozens of moments I heard stuff in China Doll in a hot tub in Palm, a different yeah. time in Palm. No, maybe it was the same weekend. Yeah. Now I think about it, yeah. but all these moments, you like I was, I heard Gamora for the first time yeah, three yeah. days ago. And that yeah. riff, we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, it's ridiculous. Dun, 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 dun. We all yeah, have that yeah. vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. But he, but he nailed, he nailed that. that. He nailed that. He was amazing at that. And I think a lot of people don't realize. And this is this is like I think when I when I was younger, I found the Grateful Dead before I played guitar. Mm -hmm. And then as I got became into guitar, I, I did this, uh, Hendrix, Stevie Ray. I went down that rabbit yep. hole. Then I got really into like you know jazz and mm -hmm. all that stuff, and and didn't realize till I kind of made this full circle how complex the Grateful Dead music is. Because I kind of, when I started playing, and also a lot of the guys I was hanging around with that just wasn't their thing. We all said that, yeah, you know, are, and it yeah. was like, oh, they're not. It's not a player's or the thing. or the people who but, were into it. We didn't identify with, right, which is a main right. thing, especially. Did, did you spend time on the East Coast? I, I'm from Connecticut. You're from I'm Connecticut, from like, right? We're down, we, that's so right we had, down the road from you. I, I think we were we were yeah. children of that sort of yeah. touch of gray generation, right? And looked at it and went, uh, "Yeah, I don't I don't really relate to these people, so I must not relate to the music," you know? And yeah, and then also I just felt like I don't know, just I wanted it, it, Hendrix was badass, you know. It was like I wanted to be. That was like part of the thing with the guitar was like oh, yeah. I wanted to be like. You know, That's Michael Jordan. An out, you know, it was it was an outlet to just be like, you know. Oh man, I had the costume jewelry. Yeah, yeah. I had the crazy necklaces, and the, yeah. I mean, we didn't have concho belts, but I found yeah. anything close to it. You yeah, know? I built like a shrine, a Hendrix shrine. Oh god! <laughs> By the way, I moved into my house. <laughs> I moved like, into my house, and I'm, crazy. I have all nuts. these all, all these pictures I bought over the years, but yeah, never yeah. hung them. You know, and they're yeah. in storage, and I take them out, and I'm like, these are all just Hendrix photos. Yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. just dozens of Hendrix photos. Uh, you know? Did you kind of have a when? It, it, did you have a moment that you can remember where you, A, just were like, I want to play guitar, or even like, this is what I want to do? You know, like. Oh, I was done when I first touched a guitar. Right. What, there, what brought you to that? What brought well, you my friends that? always had guitars with like, they weren't tuned and they didn't yeah. have all their strings. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever have a friend like the first, was the first guitar you ever touched? It I didn't have the all guys, the. I had the same guy you're probably talking to. Yeah, that, yeah. My best friend when growing up had the guitar with like, you know, missing a couple of strings. Four strings and not. No, yeah, this was a washburn or something. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and and you just would tune it to a chord, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and just go up and down. It was the yeah. sexiest thing. It still is. I yeah. mean, it, it is the most mystifying, beautiful thing in the yeah. world to me. You yeah. know, I mean, we pl I played six and a half hours of music yesterday. Yeah. I can't do six and a half hours of anything. anything. <laughs> <laughs> but Me I can too. somehow have six and a half hours of playing yeah. music and look up and go, yeah. is it three in the morning? Because I, th yeah. I thought my watch was wrong. Yeah, yeah. I, I honestly thought I was on West Coast time when yeah. I looked at my watch. That, that, that did kind of fly by. That's, that, it, it was crazy. 
what a place we go to. Yeah. I mean, there is a whole separate version of you that no yeah. other human being will ever interact with that only right. your guitar knows. Right, right. There's giant partitions on your hard drive that no yeah. human being will ever identify. Yeah. When you're playing in G and you just know that right up here is the thing that goes da ba ba yeah, yeah. and you know that right below it to the left goes da 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 yeah, yeah. no human being will ever interact with you on that level. Right, but right, when you right. pick up a guitar, it's like you ever have a friend who has another friend that you don't know, but they know so well it makes you jealous? Yeah. That's sort of what playing the guitar is like. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's just tough to be around you, Eric, because I don't yeah. know you in college, yeah. and your college buddies know you by a different nickname. Right. My guitar yeah. knows me by all different I names know. than anyone else in the world. I mean, like, yeah. That's always tough when, it's, when you have a, a woman in your life. But yeah, I won't go there. I'm, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, ex you know, they look at the guitar. They're like, really? You're always gonna go to that? Before well, I was always else. astounded at how little it matters how good you are at the guitar, right? In a relationship, right. this is true. Too. How little it matters, yeah. and I just, if you really investigate this, you're upset either way, right? Because yeah. if you're playing the guitar, and your girlfriend doesn't like lean in and go that's good what right. is that yeah you're a little butthurt yeah but if they do <laughs> you're like give me my space right that's hilarious you can't wow. win you couldn't uh, win if someone came in and went like that's bluesy <laughs> you'd go like shut up you don't yeah, know what bluesy yeah, but, is yeah, right. uh, uh, but that's if they hilarious. don't then it just feels like i guess i'm you i guess i'm just me. your delinquent son <laughs> playing my guitar that you don't understand oh man you know but no, but, but but once I started listening to Jerry enough, yeah. and this is not an uh, over rationalization, he's coming from the same place Jimmy was coming from. Right, coming from the same place. So, I would love at some point in our life to in, to really investigate and or set straight the irony of people who loved Jimi Hendrix saying, "Jerry's not for me because I'm a Hendrix guy. Like right. I'm a blues guy. I'm not a yo. I hear Jerry do stuff, and I go, that is." Jimmy's exact little rainbow road yep, that he was yep. running on. They yep. were running on the same road. Totally. They were. Did you ever hear Jerry play certain kinds of riffs and wonder what records he'd listen to in that year that made right. him play those riffs? Because right. you look at the year and go, oh, he got a Cream record. Right, right. Oh, there is some of that, actually. I hear Jerry playing some, some Eric Clapton yeah. stuff sometimes. Totally, totally. And I go, I look down and it's like 69 Fillmore and I go, oh, oh he record, had a Cream record. Yeah, he was listening to that record right there. You know? It's funny, totally. I... I was talking to Clapton one time and I forgot that he was Eric Clapton. And I said, uh, did you ever get into the dead? Did you ever, were you ever, did you ever get yeah. in the dead, Eric? And he said, well, no, uh, we were, they were, we, we were always in, you know, they were, they were a San Francisco thing and, and we yeah. were in Europe and I was like, oh, right, you were in Cream at the same time <laughs> as the yeah. Grateful Dead. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. forget like yeah. the person you're talking to yeah. Yeah. is like, oh, you were there, right. right. You yeah. were, right, in, you know, forgetting that the guy you're talking to was boots on the ground right, right. right there. It was like, right. well, no, because the cream was sort of doing, you know, like when someone says the cream, you're like, oh, that's legit. You're like, that's <laughs> legit. But, but, but what we learn as we get older is that all this stuff is fairly well connected, you know? Totally. Uh, do you have favorite, favorite songs for one reason, or favorite performances of songs that cause you thought the guitar was particularly otherworldly that night? Are there things that... Dude, I mean, you know, just this last week, digging into that Jerry band live, it's from like 91, mm -hmm. which has the tangle up in blue on that. He goes to a whole other stratosphere that I'd never really realized was there. And it's like, and it was funny because I know people always are like, you know, say that Trey and uh, Trey and Jerry, and I, I get that. But here I feel like there's, it's like. There, he goes someplace that kind of sounded like where Fish goes. Oh, that's interesting. But, he, but it, it's, he's just blazing. I've never heard the energy on that live recording. It's just unreal. He's going for it for a solid eight minutes. And that's the Hendrix just thing. going. Is being able to forget about what you just played yeah. and work in, in the moment and yeah. course through it and not become self-critical. And uh, I think part of the genius of Jerry Garcia was that all guitar players have little segments we work with and you know little riffs licks you hear these phrases like licks and riffs and we work in these building blocks some people's building blocks are like just scales yeah. you know at the very yeah. bottom if you want to make a hierarchy you go at the bottom is scales yeah. and as you keep moving up to the higher degrees of guitar playing they get a little smaller they get right. they, they become little phrases 
right? So you start with scales if you're just, then you get to licks. Yeah. Then you get to phrases, which is like your own version of licks, like right. taking licks and making them work for you. And then maybe one more level if you're like the best around is you're taking those things and completely inverting those licks to make them a little new. Jerry Garcia was down to molecules right, of right. playing. So he wasn't playing licks. Right. He's playing with the smallest building block a person can put together. So everything you're always hearing is original and off the top of someone's head and represents some sort of spiritual whereabouts that one day. So the man's working in particles. You and I are working in Legos. Right. Some people work in bricks. <laughs> right, so right, right. some people work in entire prefabricated homes. Yeah. We're probably yeah, at like yeah. Legos, right? Yeah, so we yeah, can make, yeah. and then he was working in molecules. Right, right. He was, he was like, today I'll make a tree. And on, I feel like on top of that, and it goes back to not realizing how complex the music can be. Mm -hmm. He played over these song forms and these chord changes, maybe they're not the most complex in the world, but they exist and sometimes they are complex in a way that you didn't even know they were there. Yep. You know, and, and there's this fluidity and, and, you know, doing whatever you want to say, chromatic stuff or whatever, but you never knew it didn't like sound jazzy per se, but it didn't always, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, it's just the most unique playing yep. that I've, that I've come across. You want, you want to hear some breakdowns of Jerry's playing that I came up with over the years? He has this completely own dynamic, so he's not really playing the guitar with the ferocity of guitar players, right. which means you can hear it forever, because he's not playing with that sort of hormonal ferocity right. that most guitar players have. He's playing with a certain pitch bendiness that he, all guitar players have their different sort of intonation. His intonation is so beautiful, the way he shakes a note, the way he bends up to a note. Something about it is like, Little bird bones. Right. Little right, right. cute, beautiful feathers and bird bones where a lot of guitar players are like, no, I'm a B-52. Right. I'm a stealth bomber. And he was working in these little, like the like the veins on a leaf. Right. You know, these really beautiful, tendrily sort of things. And the other thing is his unbelievable ability to have worked inside of the major scale. as much. So he was, you know, you... you most guitar teachers tell you, like, if you play the minor blues and move it, it's the country blues. Right. But he wasn't doing country blues. He no. was doing blues, but taking out a lot of the blue notes as we know them. So it was this thing that wasn't, you know, in a way it, it wasn't, and we use the parlance of the era of saying it was white music or black music, you know, mm -hmm. to say that's what people were talking about, is it was rhythm and blues or it was country. And he kind of straddled it musically in the middle where if you really start breaking it down, like, he's playing minor and major at the same time that allows you to play forever because your ear never goes like oh this is too bluesy or oh this is too campy right so if you if you solo in a major pentatonic it becomes a little da -da -dum, da -da -dum, dum -da. it's like right, skipping right. through the woods if you play in the minor pentatonic for too long you're like okay i have we have been to the yeah. we have been to you and you're down and you're wailing and we got right. it he straddled all of these things that no one guitar player will you and i should both go and do it would take you and me and six other guitar players to equal, to even come close to equaling one performance of Jerry Garcia's in a lot. And of he he also, you know, actually digging into the Grateful Dead music, I, I used to always kind of, kind of stay away from playing in major scales. You know, it was like always kind of like, I mean, you you have to, but I, in write in, in songwriting, it was like, it's, well, it's also the bands that I was in. We would always want to play these grooves that were, and we'd get to the major part. I'd be like, I'd rather play over the yeah. the minor section. Yeah. You know, but it's uh, from from kind of absorbing as much as I can of of his playing. We, we both kind of shunned major scale stuff. Yeah. Now I'm I, bringing it back. Man. Oh, I'm totally bringing it back. B.B. King was playing major oh, scale was. stuff. He B.B. King was going, wait, we all heard it as, do da da ba do 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 And he was going, ba da 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 Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the trip we take as guitar players is we look at the same photos differently. You know, you talk about like, like people who go back, like cops and detectives who go back to the original photos and go, yeah. why didn't I see that before? It was right there, that license plate back there. Yeah. And that's what we do is we go back over the same music, but with a better brain for it. And that's why we just keep listening and, and breaking down all these things. And I don't think you'll ever really break down the genetic code of how to how to make a Jerry Garcia. You can no. you can kind of do it with Hendrix, you know. Like if you if you gave yourself more, six months, yeah. you could you could sound. I mean, like yeah. you you could you could fool a lot of people. I've been doing this for 
three, four years now. Yeah. But going on four years, I can't come close. <laughs> I mean, I might get a couple seconds where yeah, my playing yeah. turns to the light in a way yeah. that cheats yeah. for a couple of seconds. Yeah. I might make you have to look down at the serious display for a second yeah. to go, wait, is this? Oh, of course, yeah, it's dead. Yeah. You know? Well, that's so, how, how did you approach A, like learning all the material, yeah. and B, inserting like your thing into it you know i mean and how did you come into it with with that thought in mind yes like so number one this is actually an interesting way to like lay out the recipe yeah. number one i didn't know what to be afraid of so i didn't concern myself right but had i seen long strange trip before any of that stuff i would have been shit scared yeah so i knew that i didn't know what was scary so i didn't look into it right i that was my advantage i knew that i had already endured a certain kind of trial by fire in the press and in court of public opinion. And I knew that I had survived, right? So I knew that I wasn't, I wasn't going to get taken out by any one faction, right? Right. And then the other thing was I trusted that I, like, I, I learned those songs at the same time I was falling in love with them. So look, when you're 12 songs into loving that band, you know... You're another hundred songs to go. You're going to love. It's it gets to a preponderance of evidence. You're like, I'm gonna love all these. Yeah, so, yeah. as I was loving a song, I would learn it. You right, know, I remember right. where I was when I heard Dark Star, and it was the original one that started da 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 da. da yeah. You know, the single version. Yeah, yeah. And it was the first time I understood the form of the song. I went home and went, I get Dark Star now. Right. You've done. It's like the Matrix. Yeah. You go, whoa, I know Kung Fu. So I was already, whether or not Dead & Company was in the future for me, I was just going to do that anyway. Right, right. So it wasn't like I was sitting around and, and I decided that that would be neat to do with my time. I was already going to go on this path. Right, right. I just, in a really interesting way, just brought the scholarship of guitar playing along with me. So yeah, as yeah. I got to know them, like there was always a level of like this. I'd hear a song and I wouldn't force myself to learn it. I would just listen to it for a while. And then I would pick up the guitar and I would just touch what key it was in. You know, you ever done this where you're trying to learn a song, you got a couple days, yeah. you don't sit and cram. Listen to it for a while so yeah. you understand where it moves, you can anticipate. Then you pick up the guitar and you go, oh, it's an A. And if you know the key, you can know, that, oh, that must be A to D because you put all the sort of chord numbers in it. And then from there, I would just spar right. with these songs, just spar and spar and spar and spar. Playing two recordings. Playing two or, recordings. Yeah, yeah. You've done this, you yeah, know, you yeah, spar. Of yeah. And you and sometimes if you want to, you can try to ignore the, the guitar player. Right, have you ever right. done this when you were young, growing up? <laughs> yeah, you just yeah, the yeah. cockiest thing of all time, but you have yeah. to. It's like ignore BB King and play over him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend there's no BB <laughs> King on this record. Yeah, and you learn to sort of center cancel in your own brain, like phase right. cancel the, the the lead guitar. Right. And I remember doing rehearsals with the band and bringing the the recordings back. And I keep mentioning that I have, it's hard to, I have a driver. I have yeah, a guy yeah. who drives me in LA and he and I just sort of took this trip together through yeah. through my learning the songs. Yeah. And I would come home and like, I would play him the stuff in the car and I would yell at myself yeah. and I would go, nope, see Tim, this sucks, yeah. this sucks. And, and I remember the first time I played like five seconds that I bought. Yeah. Like my ears, here's what people need to understand. My ears are better than my hands. Right, Do you feel right, this way about right, you? Right, oh. I, I feel like most most of us are like that. I'm, I, my Think. ears are better than my hand. My yeah, ears yeah. are 10 times better than my hand. So yeah. I know when I overplay. I know as I'm playing that it's not working. Right. Do you ever yell at yourself while you're playing? Oh, my God. You have, you have, I was yelling like, at myself last night. Yeah, you have like a... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have a you have a tennis coach on yeah. the side, yeah, and yeah. and my tennis coach goes like, "Really? You're going yeah. that way? You played it, did that? I mean, that's why you you have to wonder whether drugs played a part in being able to distance yourself from that voice." Right, right. Oh, that's right. clever. Yeah. Oh, that right. you're gonna hit him with that old chestnut. Are you gonna do that? Oh, you're gonna, oh, you gonna oh, Albert. Again? Again? Oh, are you gonna <laughs> Albert King them again? Now it's time for the more. I actually heard like a little clip from last night. I was like, "Really? Again? I did that again, again with again? that." Again? Again with that, but there would be sometimes like well, also sometimes you play something you're like, oh man, that was really cool. Did anyone hear that? I gotta do that one more time to make sure they heard oh, that. Listen, listen, <laughs> listen, listen, listen. So and then, then, then no one hears it, and you're like, if any of you are back, then you like, listen back to it, you're like, and you, you remember that you're about. Okay, yeah, yeah. so you ever cringe because you remember the moment before oh, it actually plays? And that you're like, happened. That you're happened like, today. Oh, this is the time I did this twelve more times. Dude, that's what I call practicing on stage. You play oh, a lick man. that you almost yeah. landed, and you're like, yeah. you just start taking stage time to just basically try and nail a skateboard trick. 
<laughs> it's the oh, guitar yeah, equivalent of a skateboard trick. That is hilarious. And then you listen back to it and you're like, oh no. Why did I, I do remember that? I'm just about yeah, to do this? So yeah. the other one for me that happens all the time, which teaches me to slow down in this band, yeah. is I'll listen to, can I remember, you know, you remember yeah. a song, as soon as it plays, you're like, you kind of know everything you ever played when you listen back to it. Yeah. And I'll hear this moment and it'll be so good, but I'll remember the experience and I'll know that I leave it in like five seconds and yeah, go yeah, to some overplaying. Some and I almost yell like, don't go, well, you're gonna fail. And then yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. no, it was working. It was working. Well, that's something else. Have you ever gone back to a recording of yourself and said, I played it too little? I've never, I've never only in my life. ever said I've played too much. Um, here's where I might have. If I would have played a blues or something and just nothing ventured, nothing gained, and yeah. just kind of licked my way through it, maybe, but not in terms of notes played. Right. At my most boring to myself, I think it's the greatest. I mean, we yeah. did, we did. Uh, but in the moment, you feel like it's not enough, or that's my that's my issue. I feel like I get better with age to just yes. like say fuck it, and so, I'm gonna leave. A, I'm gonna leave four bars and just then play something else. So you're then, trying to get car Krasno, yeah, to catch up with guitar Krasno. <laughs> right. So Car Krasno is listening to stuff and he's happy when things just chill. Yeah, man, that playing little goes a long way. That's just enough. Guitar Krasno on stage yeah. is going, no, I'm judging everything I play based on the scholastic content of the thing. Right. So it's always got to be scholastically sound. Yeah. And Car Krasno listens back to that and goes, you idiot. <laughs> Exactly. You idiot, dude. We we did. But a I think they're the only one thing that I try to factor in to give alleviate some of my hatred for myself is that I'm thinking, okay, well, it was the energy of that's the moment, correct. And it was the energy of the people there. That's correct. We had to kind of we that's had to pull 100%. it up, you know. But all that leads to a real admiration and almost astonishment at how the Grateful Dead was yeah. able to satisfy both the vibe of the crowd and make the most listenable live recordings yes. since Bill Evans. Yes. You know, Bill Evans, any live recording he ever did is worth cherishing. Yes. Any live performance the Grateful Dead ever did for the mo for like 99.9% .9 is worth cherishing. So yeah. how did they service the crowd and service Car John, who sits there and goes, Man, I don't know what was going on in 1974. I don't know what the politics were of that moment, but man, this stuff works in 2000, whatever. Yeah. And we, and, and you're right, because we go, especially with Dead and Company, I go, well, it's a little aggro, but in that moment, everybody was losing their minds. So what an incredible band to have right. been able to do both right. and make recorded music, right. not just documents yeah. of the moment, but like record. It was a live recording studio on stage right, right now. Right. You know. And by the way, we've talked for like an hour, we have to, and know, haven't I, even. I have to play yeah, in like play. Five and haven't minutes. even come close to figuring this shit out. Well, that's thing. That was like a great. I wish we could. I kind of. I wish we could keep going, but um. No, let's go. This is beautiful. You have to break this up into like nine parts. All, All of right. this is. Just important. as I thought, the conversation was over. I asked Mayor if earlier, when discussing the Grateful Dead, he meant the five eight seventy seven Scarlet Fire, when indeed he meant the five five seventy seven version from New Haven. This led to several more minutes of some choice rap about Stevie Ray Vaughan and their mortality as players. 5577 five, seven is the New Haven Scarlet Fire, which I think is more exciting to me than 5-8, which we all know is Cornell. 5-5 yeah, five, yes. five is New Haven. And I, I had both. I had both recordings. But 5877 was... That's that was actually yeah. the one that like drew me into like collecting tapes, which I think it's the same for a lot of them. Like, yeah, well, 5-5 five, five for me... The transition is the most identifiable to me based on my life as being Hendrixy, yeah, 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 watery, yeah. Okay. brilliantly recorded. One. Yeah. Also, I yeah, you and I are yeah. products of the '80s, yeah. so we like fidelity, sonic right, fidelity. Right. I don't want to hear wax cylinders. Yeah. Like I yeah. love Big Bill Brunzi, but I don't yeah. want to hear you know not that it's yeah. wax cylinder, but yeah. it's post wax cylinder. But like you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I love Lightning yeah. Hopkins, but I'm not putting it on the treadmill. Right. Right. And so. <laughs> So, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a good one. So, yeah. so we like a certain fidelity to deliver what the right. music is. And the Spring 77 tapes with the Betty Board tapes, oh, I think bring a lot oh, yeah. of modern fans into the really music. Think about it like well, that. Stevie Ray Vaughan yeah. was, was that for me. That right. was a lot of Texas blues 
brought through the MTV Sonic filter. The, live at the Elma combo. Just oh, yeah. Went nuts over that. that oh, I went nuts. Nuts. I li- wore that. I had a VHS copy, and I wore it all nuts. the way out. It's, br- it's, per- it's perfect beginning to end. It's unreal. It's I remember playing in there, and like I mean, we got there, and it was like this crappy club, and I was like, oh, this is the greatest gig ever. It We're must have been. Crush it. How many <laughs> times do you think you watched that? Hun- I mean, hundreds. hundreds. I watched yeah. it hundreds of my times. My uncle knew. My uncle, who was actually an agent, and he knew. He knew. You might. You might know my uncle, Ron Kaplan. Uh, but he. He was. He was an agent. I don't know if he was actually Steve Ray's agent, but he, knew, he hung with all the blues guys. Anyway, he somehow got a tape of that. I don't, I don't know if it was already out in yeah. distribution. Anyway, he sent me a tape of that when he knew. I had just started playing and I had like this crappy copy strat and he sent me that and I literally just stared in front of that thing with my uh all the way. I mean every last move you memorized it. Yeah. I mean I don't even know what the Unreal. analog is for I mean it was like studying game tapes, like watching Jordan games or Tyson fights or something. It was just Well perfect. that's that's the thing about that recording too, and just him in general, was his stamina. I mean, even just to play like to play like eight bars of a Stevie Ray Vaughan solo would probably wear me would out wear, for it, like <laughs> it's, an hour. It's one yes. of those genetic things where your music follows your genetics. Yeah. And for me, the Stevie Ray Vaughan thing, the yeah. timing is impeccable. <laughs> impeccable timing. And he will always land the lick on the one. Always. 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 He taught me never just play the lick and let it run over the bar line. Yeah, yeah. That's the number one thing to guitar play. Right, I want right, to tell all guitar right, players. Right, right. You know? And that was the difference. I mean, a lot of people are like Hendrix, Stevie Ray Vaughan. I mean, Stevie Ray Vaughan just had a precision that was precision. Un- I don't even know who ever. the boxer is. I ever. wish I knew boxing analogies. I can tell you who he fought yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. But so sharp. Yeah. And so intense. And, and I think fulfilled a certain desire we had as kids. Right for things to be like adrenalized, yeah, yeah. you know? Like I'm looking at my life now as a post 40 year old and I'm yeah. going, I'm going, where where are the examples of people who play with that fire past a certain age? And then I went, a lot of those guys are gone That's before crazy. 40. All I the guitar, know. a lot of the guitar players who were responsible for setting into motion this high energy style of guitar playing, yeah. I, we don't have points of reference for how to play in our 40s like that. Yeah. Because they didn't make That's it, crazy. which I've is never super sad. That but we don't know how Stevie would have played yeah. at, at his age I now. If he would have slowed down. I, I don't. Know. I don't know. We don't know how to look up to yeah. Yeah. heroes past forty. We don't really yeah. have many guitar yeah. heroes right. past that. You know, kind of crazy. So I was playing with the trio on this last tour, going. Yeah. I don't know how to judge myself right. based on the uh, the slight muscle fat loss in your hands. Right. For, right. I mean, you, right. you ever feel right. it? Right. I feel it a little bit. A little bit, I feel right? It a little bit. Top yeah. of your hand, just yeah, over. Yeah. T- it's just a little oh, bit. Yeah, I get a little bit. Yeah. I, I get it on on this side too. So I go. I don't know how to compare it to another yeah. fire brand guitar player in their forties. I can't wait for someone to hear that and go like, "Shut up, man!" Paul Gilbert. I'm like, I know. Yeah, yeah, I just can't yeah. think of any right now that right, I that yeah, I like yeah. are in my direct wheelhouse. Right. So. Right. Right. This was a friggin' awesome conversation. I know. Somewhere, this somewhere again. inside, we'll you and I just want to keep going until it's done. I know, I know. Let's, let's just keep going. Let's somewhere keep inside, going. the nihilist in us wants to keep going. There you have it. John Mayer and Eric Krasno. That was pretty darn special. You've been listening to the Relics Audio Hour. I am your host, Jesse Lauder. You can learn more about me on my website, J-E-S-S-E-L-A-U-T-E-R dot com. And if you enjoyed what you heard, there is going to be plenty more from where that came from. So be sure to subscribe to the Relics Audio Hour on the podcast platform of your choice. The Relics Audio Hour is a part of the Osiris Podcast Network. To learn more about Osiris and their many amazing podcasts about music, be sure to visit OsirisPod.com. And I have many people to thank for making this episode possible. First, big thanks to Eric Krasno, Brad Tucker, Brandon Phelps, Bernie Cahill, Christina Tanner, Ken Healy, Josh Timmermans for our cover photo, Mary Beth Ongier, and Gopher Dindis Productions. And I'd also like to thank Officer Huffman of the Virginia State Police for my speeding ticket that I received on my way to lock in. Thanks for doing your job, Officer. Our theme music was composed by Marco Benevento. You also heard a little bit from Joshua and the Holy Rollers' forthcoming EP, a great new band from Los Angeles. Be sure to check them out. You're currently listening to Cats Under the Stars from Lettuce's Jerry Garcia Band Tribute from Lockin, which featured John Mayer and Bob Weir. Many thanks again for tuning in, guys, and look forward to having you back next time on the Relics Audio Hour. Relics Audio Hour.